We'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar session. This is part three of three on segmentation and how it drives SME channel and offer strategies. And now we'll go ahead and turn the webinar over to our expert presenter, Sandy Vasi. Jessica, thank you, Solet. Let me start with a very warm welcome to everyone and a very quick review of what we have covered before. Uh, because this is uh, number three in a three-part webinar series. Uh, we started with channels, if uh, uh, you may remember, at least those who had uh, joined us before. Uh, we talked about basic channel designs, uh, how to avoid pitfalls, uh, rules of thumbs for success, uh, how the whole thing is actually driven by segmentation, um, how we need to take into account local market realities, how we can use creativity and alliances, and how we need to be mindful of regulatory issues. Then we carried on and in the second seminar uh, we talked about products or offers and we talked about uh, many different things, among them the innovative approaches to SME offers. Uh, we talked about building alliances to bring those, uh, those innovative approaches along, uh, the development processes we can use to, uh, uh, to come up with the right offer, and once again we tied all of that back to targeting and, uh, and, and looking at the right segments uh, that uh, uh, we need to go after. Now, finishing the whole thing off is actually now segmentation. So today we are finally getting to all these things that are driving all the stuff that we talked about before. So what we are going to cover today is segmentation and segmentation focusing on SMEs in the banking sector. Uh, we'll start with the high level basics, uh, some SME segment definitions around the world, talk about what segmentation is itself, uh, building a layered model to keep things simple, uh, and, and, uh, and also what to use segmentation for how it all ties back to the things we discussed before. We'll uh, touch on a couple of interesting uh, uh, ideas and developments like self-segmentation, big data because it gets a lot of press these days, and also CRM which is in fact the ultimate segmentation tool. Before we get into all of that, um, let me uh, do a, a brief self-introduction. So once again, my name is Sandy Vassi. I uh, have been associated with a small business <coughs> banking network for some time now. Uh, I have what in English we call a checkered background. I've been in business for about 35 years, worked in 50 countries. I had uh, at last count 23 moves in my life. The only stable point is that I had the same wife for all these years. I started my career at Procter & Gamble in Canada. Uh, worked with uh, Cadbury International and then in the banking sector at Citibank, uh, Global Consumer Bank, Raiffeisen International, Royal Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Canada, Credit Bank of Moscow, enough. Uh, instead of carrying on about me, you see my smiling face on the screen there, let us start about segmentation and uh, let us really start at the very end because Segmenting the SME universe out there is one thing, but first we actually have to reassure ourselves that we are doing segmentation within our organization, right? Which means separating out the SME business unit. So, aha, and this is where it doesn't go down anymore. <laughs> okay, I got it right, it's working. So, uh, if this is working, then let's talk about uh, getting the uh, uh, the whole approach right and get the, uh, the basic approach working. Well, here's the thing. The first point is SME business unit should be separated out. And uh, if we need to put it somewhere, this separate business unit, we should put it under retail. There are a lot of good business reasons for this and there are a lot of good customer reasons for it. From a business perspective, when we look at SMEs, very often they don't have any collateral, they don't have any records, they don't have the kind of things that we would normally use with a corporate client to assess whether or not we can grant a loan. Uh, SME units are also very costly to serve out of the corporate banking unit. 
uh, my calculations show that it would cost us about six times more to serve an SME client using the corporate banking approach than using the retail banking approach. To top it all off, when we look at the uh, loan loss distribution of SME clients, it much more closely matches the retail customer, private individual uh, credit loss distribution than the corporate distribution. So we can use the same kind of statistical models that we are using in the consumer bank for SMEs, but we cannot use the corporate banking approach. And just at the very end, imagine asking a corporate banker to start dealing with SMEs now. For this guy, it's a big step down. For a consumer banker, it is a big potential step up because now he's not only going after the individual business of somebody, but he's going after the business business of the same person. So I would rather motivate my salespeople to step up than to demotiv them demotivate them by asking them to step down. So from a business perspective, it makes a hell of a lot of sense to, uh, uh, to put everything under the retail umbrella, separate it out. Now, from the customer's perspective, if we are talking about the SME client, well, guess what? They don't want us to spend two weeks to review their books to grant a loan. They operate in the today. They operate on, on five-minute intervals. They want fast response. They, uh, they don't want to kind of go around and look at books. They, they just want to know, do I get that loan? Do I not? So from their perspective, to use the retail banking approach is also much more preferable. Not of it all, let's separate out SME business unit within the bank, and then if we have to put it somewhere, let's put it under the retail bank. Now, if we are building an SME banking unit, well, uh, my approach uh, is, and my advice is, build it gradually. First, Let's define the what, then the which, then the how. So let's not try to kind of swallow the whole elephant all in one. Uh, as they say, you eat an elephant by, by cutting it into pieces. Let's do the same thing with the SME approach. Let's also be aware of the local peculiarities. SMEs differ in average size by country. Regulations differ by country. The level of informal versus formal SMEs also differ by country. And what I mean here, is that there are a lot of SMEs that are there for tax avoidance. We don't necessarily want to deal with those guys. We want to deal with the ones who actually provide economic value added. So we need to separate them out. And that may again differ by country. Now, if we did all of this, then also let's be uh, very happy about the what I call the SME math. And SME math uh, goes like this. In regular mathematics, 1 plus 1 equals 2. In SME math, 1 plus 1 equals 3.2. The reason for this is because if I go after the personal business of an SME owner and the business business of the same owner, if I put these two together, I will see some synergies and these synergies will boost my revenue and my profit by 60%. So 1 plus 1 2 plus 60 percent equals 3.2. So, go after SMEs, keep in mind getting both sides of the, of the equation, keep in mind the local peculiarities, put them on the retail, and then we really start the business. Or do we? Well, um, what is an SME? An SME can be defined in many different ways. There are four, five, six, seven different ways of defining what an SME segment is therefore where we should be targeting. We can define it by the number of employees and you can see it up on the screen how it is done in different areas around the world. And this is where some of the issues come in because in different parts of the world the definitions will differ. So we can define it by the, uh, uh, the number of employees. We can also define it by sales. We can define it by assets. We can define it by loans advanced. We can define it by any other variables. My advice would be, let's use common sense. Let's uh, agree on some kind of definition parameters, but keep flexibility about the values that go into those parameters, because otherwise we will be looking for a lot of internal battles. Keep that in mind. Um, 
I had situations where we wanted to uh, introduce some kind of SME definition in the market and the corporate guys called me and told me, Sandy, do you realize that by your definition, 95% of our large corporate business will migrate to the retail bank because they will be defined as SMEs. So these are the kind of battles that we have to face. If possible, we avoid. If not, we discuss. <laughs> uh, so to summarize, we have now separated out the SME banking unit within bank. If we need to put it somewhere, we put it onto the retail bank because that is better for the, uh, the customer, the SME clients, and that is better for us. Higher profit, lower cost, higher revenues. And now we are in the business. Now we are on to the next step, which is looking at the SME universe out there. We need to separate them out and segment them so that we are more efficient. What is segmentation? Segmentation is an efficiency tool. Segmentation means that we group the same kind of people or businesses into, uh, 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 into units and we start treating them as individuals. So instead of talking to each individual uh, SME client separately, we talk to the SME universe as one group. Uh, good segmentation means that the companies or people within each segment are as similar to each other as possible and the differences between the different segments are as great as possible. With that one we got a very good efficiency tool and that is very important because studies show that 80% of our efficiency loss can be due to mistargeted activities when we don't get the segments right. So if we do the basics right, the segmentation right, we avoid the potential 80% loss. So you may say, okay, good, but how do I build a segmentation model? I've seen a lot of very complicated segmentation models out there, and I really don't care for them, to be honest with you. I want to keep things very, very simple. So I always start with, okay, so where is the money? This is called value-based segmentation. That tells us in the whole big universe out there, what are those companies that actually have enough revenue, enough profit, so that we can make some money on them? That in itself is not enough, because within this big group, hopefully big group, we need to identify those where we can actually mine this opportunity, so we can actually get some of this money. And that is called propensity-based segmentation that tells us within the, 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 the group of companies where there is enough money, enough value available, what are those where we can actually get a chunk of this? Now, this propensity-based segmentation, sometimes the propensity is a difficult thing to do, so very often we use a proxy or a substitute, and that is behavioral type segmentation. Behavioral type segmentation basically looks at how these companies use different products, what they already have, how they behave, and based on that we predict whether or not we can actually get some of that value. The next thing then is, okay good, so we know where the money is, we know um, uh, which companies we can actually mine this value uh, of, but now the big question is how do we define these companies? And that is where the so-called demographic segmentation comes in. Demographic segmentation uh, very simply uses readily available information, hard-coded, easy to define information to describe these companies, their owners. We can say, okay, this is the size, this is the gender of the owner, uh, this is the, the revenue, the turnover, this is where they are located, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are all things, information that we can get and, and are kind of black and white. They can be defined. So now we got to the point that, okay, we know where the money is. We know within this uh, money segment uh, where we can uh, mine this, uh, this money, this value. We, act, we can actually define who these companies are. The only thing is left is how we are going to talk to them. And how we talk to them will depend on how these companies actually, most, in most cases, the owners, think about themselves, think about their companies, think about the future, the role 
their, their company will play in the future and how they relate to the world. That is called psychographic segmentation. Okay, if we got these four elements right, we know where the money is, we know where we can get that money, we can define these companies and we know how to talk to them, then we got a segmentation approach. Now, as I mentioned on the propensity segmentation, we can use substitute information if the, uh, uh, the original information is not available and for propensity, for example, behavioral segmentation is a very, very good one. Now, before we go any further, I have a question for you. Uh, the first question, just to keep it interesting and interactive. So, here's the thing. Pick one of the, uh, uh, the following five. As you remember, I just said that uh, we can segment SME, uh, uh, the, the SME universe, based on by the business or based on by the owner. Um, and the question I would ask you is, what do you think? what should be our main approach to, to segmenting this universe? Should it be done primarily by the business characteristics, by the owner characteristics, by both owner and business equally, uh, by those characteristics which are easiest to get, or by either or both depending on the situation? So let me give you a, a few seconds to make up your mind and, and I I think uh, Jessica will, uh, will tally all of this. You can uh, click appropriately. I think we got the technology to help us, right, Jessica? Absolutely. So this is the time that we would love for our participants to participate. Please go ahead and, and choose uh, one of the answers. So go ahead and take a guess if you're not sure. And Sandy will, will give us the, the right answer um, in a few moments here. <laughs> Not sure is the right answer. It's, it's the answer that works for me. <laughs> you see, with all with all of these things, honestly, it's it. Yeah, uh, we're getting some responses coming in, so we're going to wait about ten more seconds. So if we can see um, if people want to keep responding for about five more seconds. Okay, great. Um, well, it, it looks like um, by a, a small margin, um, as you can see, we can see either or both depending on the situation, so about 40%, um, and then hold split on, equally on. between. I this thing so that I can see it, uh, because it doesn't show <laughs> my screen. <laughs> Um, primarily by business characteristics, about 31%, and by both owner and business characteristics equally is 31% as well. So thanks everyone for participating. Okay, Jessica, how can I uh, look at this? <laughs> I'm not sure you're able to. Um, if you want to just oh. uh, go ahead and give us back to the, um, oh, okay. well, the presentation. Okay. Fine, fine, fine. So I'm not even looking at this. So this is a really kind of nice blind test. Okay, well, well here's the thing. Um, if um, if we wanted to segment uh, either by business or by owner characteristics, which is the, the first one or two, uh, then we are missing the big picture. Uh, if you remember the SME math I mentioned, uh, we need to look at both the business business and the personal business uh, of the owner. Uh, we should not ignore the other. So number one and number two is not really uh, optimal. Uh, by both owner and business characteristics equally would be a very, very good answer, but unfortunately many times uh, they are not, the information is not available equally. Uh, and by taking the, the, the other approach by uh, owner of business which are easiest to get, uh, we basically uh, back ourselves into a very comfortable situation where we say, oh well, this information is very difficult to get, so we just don't worry about it. And I would never advocate that. So, uh, really the opportunistic approach uh, uh, would dictate number five, which is by either or both depending on the situation. Uh, that is, is, is one of the, uh, the better answers or number three by both owner and business characteristics equally, which would be in my books be uh, the, the number two. So. Um, uh, the, the big idea is that we should be looking at both sides, uh, the personal and the business side uh, of information available and then, then use whatever we can uh, 
uh, to carry on and do segmentation. And this is what I'm saying in bold letters at the uh, at the bottom of this slide. Use both business and owner owner characteristics for best results and be opportunistic. This is not science. This is practice. So the variables we can use, oh God, there are, there are millions. So we can look at the company, we can look at the owner, we can look at the, uh, even the, the client status. You know, is the owner already our client? Is the company already our client? Are they related to uh, somebody uh, who is already a client? We can look at the size, we can look at their needs. Uh, we can look at the location, the industry type where we'd like to focus, and subtypes. Like it's not enough to say services. We can look at within services. You know, a hairdresser and a, and and the local uh, uh, restaurant is very different from a lawyer or an accountant. We can look at the the legal setup. Uh, is it a limited liability company? Is it for profit, non profit? Uh, we need to consider market factors and and uh, behaviors of different companies. So there's a whole lot that 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 we should be uh, uh, considering. Uh, and, and that's how we kind of move into segmentation. And once again, I hope the, the point that's coming across is let's, let's use a lot of common sense. Let's use some templates, but fill them up with common sense. So um, if you do all of that, here's my second question. <laughs> um, obviously, we do segmentation because we'd like to target uh, some segments uh, within the SME universe. And, um, if, if we wanted to define what a target segment is, what, what do you think? What is the, uh, a simple definition of target segment or an SME target segment? Uh, is it those companies that we are willing to serve? Or is it those companies that we want to sell to? Or is it those companies that uh, we are willing to pay for to become our clients? Or the companies that we can make money on? Or the companies who might be interested in our offer? So, once again, it's your turn. Uh, please pick one of them, and then Jessica will read me the results, and then we'll talk about uh, the different answers. Great. So we're getting some responses coming in. So we're going to wait about uh, 20 more seconds. And uh, thanks to everybody who's, who's voting on this. We're getting a pretty diverse, um, diverse answers coming in, Sandy. So. <laughs> I made the, the I made the question very difficult. <laughs> oh, good, very good. <laughs> okay, we're gonna wait uh, just about five more seconds now. See if we get any more responses coming in. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll at this point in time. And Sandy, we are almost equally split between. Um, <laughs> can you can you see the results? I don't know if you can see them this time. Oh, I still um, can, but you can just tell me. <laughs> the companies that uh, we are willing to serve, the companies we want to sell to, the companies we can make money on, and those companies who are interested in our offer. So we've gotten about 23% for each of those, and it looks like one or two people voted for those companies we are willing to pay for to become clients. So that was the least popular one. <laughs> uh, and maybe you can share with us the answer, Sandy. <laughs> well, um, and uh, those few people who voted for those companies we are willing to pay for to become our clients should really congratulate themselves because that is a very succinct, very uh, down-to-earth, very actionable definition of a target segment. You see, here is the thing. the the companies that we are willing to serve, well, you know what? If any company comes to me and wants my services, I should be willing to serve them. That's okay. I mean, as, as long as I didn't pay for them, uh, they come to me, my offers will always generate money because if I remember uh, during the uh, product definition, we talked about this, that any product, any segment, any channel must be profitable on its own. So I make sure that I can make money on anybody. If anybody comes to me, I'm going to make money on them, I, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to target them. So I should be willing to serve all companies, and I should be willing to sell to all companies. So number one and number two is kind of very broad, you know, yeah, I, uh, I'll do it. Now, <clears throat> number four, those companies we can make money on, once again, 
I would hope that we make money on every single client. So that is really not a great differentiator. And those companies who are interested in our offers basically tells me that it's up to them to decide and not up to me to define them as a target segment. My standard definition for a target segment is always it's those companies we are willing to pay for or invest in uh, money, time, effort to turn them into our clients because that means that I'm targeting them. Okay? Now, I'm targeting them because I can make more money on them, but I should be able to make money on every single customer. So once again, uh, the companies I'm willing to pay for are really uh, the ones that I'm targeting. That is my target segment. Okay. Um, and how, do, how I define these, <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I hope uh, everybody's kind of looking at this and going, hmm, scratch my head, but hopefully when you think about it, it starts making sense. Uh, so if you take one step uh, from this, then okay, good, so how do I define these companies? And I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago how difficult it might be to actually uh, 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 define a good target segment because I do not have all the information for segmentation. And this is when this uh, substitute information or the proxy information uh, comes in. And, and let me kind of give you an example how it works. When Raiffeisen Bank wanted to build an SME business in Poland, the bank looked at the market and said, okay, so who should be So we said, okay, so if you are in one of these uh, professions, if you've been running your business uh, in the same place for X number of years and you have not declared bankruptcy, we know you are okay. We don't care what you tell the government. You are in our target segment and that is how we build then a very successful business. So this is just one example of using proxy information, substitute information, information that correlates with the kind of stuff that we'd like to get. It's not quite that because it would be nicer to have cash flow, but if we cannot get that, then we use something else instead. This is called proxy information. And once we used whatever information and we targeted our, uh, our segment, then we say, okay, good. So we build everything on this segmentation. We can build our delivery channel. So as, as you can see on the, on the screen, we can say, okay, micro, small, medium. We have uh, uh, different channels to, to focus on these segments. Or we can carry on and we can do further sub-segmentation. And within the segment, 
that we are uh, targeting within SMEs, we can say, are there any kind of sub needs in a sub segment that we can then satisfy and can we make money on that? So it's kind of like it's not a, a target segment, it's a sub target segment. And one example I could offer you is what we did with the Credit Bank of Moscow in Russia. What we noticed is we had a lot of uh, uh, retail SME clients. These are clients who operate the small retail outlets. And their biggest problem was that uh, they handled a lot of cash and their insurance rates were very, very high because of cash handling. Insurance companies did not like the idea of these small guys having a lot of money on hand because they could be robbed. Okay, and then the insurance companies on the hook. So these clients were saying, uh, can you do something for us uh, that our insurance rates would go down? And we thought about it and we thought, okay, so let's introduce a special service for this sub-segment and this was cash collection. We built a, a brand new uh, sub-area to the company. We would go out, we would collect available cash and we would refill uh, the cash uh, tills uh, for all of these companies next day or the day after or so on. Net result for these companies is their insurance rates dropped dramatically because they did not keep that much cash on hand. For us, we built a very profitable fee-based uh, service for this specific sub-segment, the retail, the small retailers among our SME segment. We gave something very specific and very unique to our clients, so they liked it. And you know what? We actually benefited in more than one ways. It's not only that we had a very good offer to them, it's not only that we actually created a fee-based service, but we could then link the information from cash collection into our credit system. You see, what happens is when a small uh, enterprise uh, is running into trouble, the first thing that happens is they are not generating cash flow. So if we catch this early on, we can take preventative steps or if push comes to shove, we can call the loan before any of the other banks wake up. So we got an early warning system about the state of the business of all our small retail enterprises within our SME segment. As a result, we were operating with a non-performing loan portfolio of less than 1% when the whole market was operating at over 15% because we had this early warning system. So this is kind of one example of uh, how we can use uh, segmentation to drill down, identify needs, and then build offers around it. Now, we can, we can take it uh, further and further. We can build the multidimensional segmentation models. Uh, for private individuals at, at Citibank, we built a model where we said, okay, everybody starts out 18 to 25 years of age, and then they, they form a family, and then they have career years, then they retire, and they either move like this, or they move like this, or they move like this, basically based on where they are uh, in terms of their wealth. And for each uh, stage, there are life events, and for each of these life events, we can, uh, we can custom tailor an offer. So we built a segmentation grid based on this and, uh, and actually started driving our strategy uh, along these lines. And now I stop again and I ask you, uh, you see this, this is a, a kind of individually tailored uh, segmentation grid. But the question is, is this something that we can use for SMEs? Uh, so once again, pick one of three options. Uh, okay, uh, this works for uh, private individuals because they have these life stage uh, uh, events and so on, but it doesn't necessarily work well for companies. Uh, yes, it can work for companies, but uh, the parameters we need to change. Or yes, it can work for companies, uh, but we need to look at the owner and we need to look at the life events in the owner's life and do the segmentation based on that. What do you think?
Okay, we're, we're uh, getting some res responses in, so thanks to everyone for voting. And we'll wait another uh, 15 seconds or so as responses come in. Um, but at this stage, it looks like quite a few people are voting for number two. Yes, but the life stage parameters need to change. And about a third of the individuals are voting for number three, only if we are using owner-based segmentation approach. All right. Um, well, let's go ahead and close the poll at this point in okay. time. So we had about okay. um, just about split. Um, uh, about sixty percent voted for number two. Yes, but the life stage parameters need to change. And about forty percent voted for number three. Only if we are using owner-based segmentation approach. Okay. Well. Well. Uh, I'm, I'm glad nobody voted number one because I never like no for an answer. Uh, number three, if you remember early on, um, my very first question I, I, I seem to recall was about owner-based characteristic or owner characteristics versus business characteristics. And I said, let's be opportunistic and let's use both. So I would like to stay away from using only owner-based segmentation approaches. Uh, I would always like to use both owner and business characteristics, but it actually means that if I want to use this model, then the, uh, the life stage parameters, I have to adjust and I have to make them fit an SME life cycle as opposed to a private individual life cycle. And before anybody says, yeah, but how the heck can you do that? Well, here's one example. You know, um, if I look at an SME, uh, a business starts up. Uh, in the first two years, it is really in the startup stage. And then two to five years, it's, it's kind of uh, consolidating everything. And then uh, uh, five to 10 and 10 plus is different thing. Um, I can look at the number of employees that they have. And I can say, it's okay to start up with zero employees, uh, but then, you know, if you start growing, you probably have maybe up to five employees and up to 20, and then you're in a different ball game. So I look at the business characteristics. Uh, I look at, <coughs> I can also look at the owner characteristics, but basically what I do is I use the same approach, but I change the parameters by which I define the life stages of the business because the life stages of a business uh, tend to differ from the life stages of a private individual, but so what? You know, I can just use the same approach. I just use different parameters. Hence, number two, yes, we can use the same model, but the parameters we need to change to fit the specific target segment, uh, the SMEs. Okay, uh, so, um, a couple of more things I, I, I need to cover off before we, uh, uh, we finish off with the segmentation and so on. Um, the first one is uh, self-segmentation. Self-segmentation is when we basically let people segment themselves. We let the companies decide where they fit. And the first one in this domain was American Express. And uh, I don't know how many of you remember back, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, so I do. When American Express came on the market, they said, you know, if you make, I don't know, this was in the U.S., if you make $50,000 a year and you always pay your bills on time, this card is for you. And then you could basically decide, do I belong to this segment or do I not? So self-segmentation is something where we give people the opportunity that, uh, that they can put themselves into different buckets. And there are positives and negatives with all of this. And by the way, Amazon is doing something similar today when we, we buy a book on Amazon, they, they immediately tell us other people who bought this book also looked at these books. So they are suggesting that I belong to that segment, but they leave the final decision up to me. That's kind of semi-self-segmentation. Okay, so there are advantages, there are potential issues. Uh, advantages, high efficiency, uh, uh, an honest, transparent image. Uh, obviously, we talked about this uh, uh, in the channel seminar. 
a lot of decisions are already made before we have personal interaction with potential clients, but um, obviously people can tell us any kind of information. We may uh, tell them too much about our risk management rules, uh, or people may just say this is not for us. However, there is one very important issue which I did not mention on the previous slide, uh, that, that comes up with self-segmentation. So I would like you to think about this. Um, and I listed up three potential issues. The first one is that our prospects uh, may only know what they would want, but what they actually, not what they actually need. And that would obviously kind of drive self-segmentation in the wrong direction or we may have regulatory issues that would prevent us from using it, or that self-segmentation really only works with electronic channels and that obviously limits their efficiency. What do you think the biggest issue is? Once again, Jessica, over to you for the final countdown. <laughs> 10, 20 seconds, please. Uh, everybody pick one of them and then we'll talk about it. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're still getting some responses uh, coming in, so we'll wait about 20 more seconds um, as individuals are responding. Overwhelmingly, we're getting responses for number one, uh, I, which, which may be <laughs> forcing some of the next responses, but we'll wait about 10 more seconds here to see if we get any more responses coming in. So thanks to everyone who's voted so far. And we will go ahead and close the, the poll at this point in time. And overwhelmingly, we received responses for number one. So 93% of <laughs> uh, folks voting said and that overwhelmingly, I know what they want, but not necessarily what they need. And, and we had a, and then we had a couple of responses for number two as well. <laughs> and overwhelmingly, you're absolutely perfectly right. That is the single biggest issue. The, the number two and number three are also issues, but really the biggest problem is, you know, if I leave it up to these uh, SMEs to decide, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, how to segment themselves, they really only know what they want. They don't know what they need. And the biggest thing that anybody would tell you in, in selling and marketing is to explore those hidden needs, uh, to realize what these small companies really actually need and then design my offer for that need as opposed to what they tell me what they want. So congratulations, uh, perfect score. Um, that is indeed the biggest issue. I go on the web and I say, okay, good, I know what I want. Yes, sure, but I may not know what I actually need. And the company that finds out what I actually need and gives me the offer for that is the one that's going to get my business. All right, uh, let, me, uh, let me finish up with uh, uh, three quick hits at the end because now we, we talked about you know, segmentation. We started at the, at the beginning how important it is to set up SME as a separate segment within the organization why it should belong to the, uh, to the retail uh, part of the business as opposed to corporate. We talked about the segmentation approaches, uh, how to build segmentation model, uh, how to take it one step further, how to use it, how we can use self-segmentation, what the issues are, and there are three things out there in the public conscience, uh, big data, online segmentation, and CRM. So very quickly, let's walk through these things because they keep coming up. Uh, big data. Uh, big data is basically the ability to crunch huge, big masses of information. Big data used to be called predictive modeling some time ago, and a boss of mine told me once, Sandy, don't ever forget, by the time you lose a customer, you already lost him. And I thought this was the most idiotic saying I've ever heard, and I asked my boss, I told her, I said, uh, can you please explain it because I'm obviously not understanding it well. And she said, you see, what happens is a customer, you don't lose a customer by the customer all of a sudden shutting down or his business is with you. You lose a customer gradually. First you lose uh, the customer's 
husband or wife. Then you lose one of the customer's accounts. Then you lose one of the company accounts. Then you lose another customer account. Then you lose two more uh, uh, company accounts and the customer accounts and all of a sudden you just lost the person. This is a process. And what you need to do is watch out for the warning signs. And that is what predictive modeling does. And if we have huge, big reams of information, we can continuously kind of grind through them and say, okay, which of those sub-segments within our segment are the most exposed? Which are the ones that might be leaving? And what are the steps we need to do uh, to keep them? Okay. Uh, the next one is online segmentation. And online segmentation, once again, I have a quick question for you. So um, when we talk about online segmentation, do you know what, what is online segmentation? Because everybody talks about online segmentation. So um, it could be defined as segmenting my clients using interactive channels or building customer groups online in cyberspace or uh, generating instant personalized offers or using online capabilities to help in my segmentation practices. Okay, for the last question, 20 seconds. And I think for this one, we're just going to need people to respond in the chat box um, or the question box. So please feel free to um, either type in the number or um, go ahead and list which answer you think is the correct answer. And we'll wait a couple more seconds on this one. Uh, we're getting responses, very varied responses actually, so number one, number three, and number four. So we'll wait about ten more seconds. Great. Um, and so we'll go ahead and, and close um, these responses right now. And we actually have pretty even responses for each one, Sandy. So you'll have to tell us which one is the correct one. <laughs> okay. Now, the, uh, I must apologize to everybody because, you know, a lot of people talk about online segmentation. And here's the problem uh, with this uh, expression, online segmentation. It is actually not segmentation at all. <laughs> Online segmentation is, in fact, uh, building real-time personalized offers uh, during uh, an interaction, normally online. So this is a totally misleading question. And once again, my apologies, uh, because if people try to think about segmentation, well, guess what? It's called segmentation, but it really is not. Uh, so it's, it's number three, actually. Most of the time when people talk about online segmentation, they talk about number three. Uh, it's, it's a total misnomer. Segmentation, as, as I mentioned, is grouping similar companies or people into, into groups. Uh, this is not it. This is treating them individually, and it started with Peppers and Rogers, one-to-one -one, uh, marketing, and really what it is, is we are learning about our customers and we try to give them the best offer real time online based on the information that we have about them. And there are a whole lot of things that one can do that because we, we don't have the time, I don't want to run through the whole thing, but there are some very, very sophisticated analytics that, that drive all of this. Uh, the point is online segmentation is not segmentation, it is real time personalized offers. And what I need to think about is what is the information I have about my customers and how I can use this information to give them the best possible offer in response to their interaction with me. And now let, it, <coughs> let us finish up with the CRM and in the, uh, in the spirit of slightly misleading things, <laughs> uh, here's the thing, when, when we talk about CRM, because CRM is another big, big engine that drives segmentation and drives our approaches, and when I talk about CRM, I don't talk about credit risk management, I mean customer relationship management. And customer relationship management uh, uh, looks at all my potential targets, 
my customers, my potential customers, their related parties. Uh, it looks at all the channels through which I can I can reach them. It then links all of this together with the Salesforce automation or contact management system, uh, with the data mart that supplies the information, and with the marketing engine that drives my capabilities. And I always say, okay, this is not CRM. Uh, you know, uh, Margaret had a painting uh, in which he painted a pipe, and he said, Sustine Pazin Pip, this is not a pipe. And what he meant is that this is just the picture of a pipe. So if I go back, this is a picture of an IT platform that will deliver CRM automation, but it is really not CRM. What CRM is about is, is process uh, optimization, it's institutional memory, it's knowing who wants what, it's a full perspective of the personal and business affairs of my potential uh, or, or, or real clients is the same information at every single point and it is using all of that to constantly segment and re-segment my base and regenerate the best offers and, and, and use the best approach to present those best offers to my identified segments or sub-segments. That is really what CRM is. It is not, you know, some kind of an IT platform. As I said, this is not a pipe. <laughs> so uh, that is where I wanted to finish up with this, you know, online segmentation CRM and uh, and big data, just so that we, uh, we don't forget about them. Uh, there are a number of diagnostic questions that I listed up and I know that these slides are available to all of you, uh, so please use them, ask yourself the questions, where are we in terms of organization, the basics, the skills and strategy and execution and so on, and with that one you can pretty much peg uh, where you stand and uh, uh, then hopefully you remember some of the things we went through. The, the high level basics, uh, setting up the organization, how SME uh, definitions differ around the world, uh, how we can use it. Uh, again, all I can say is let's use common sense, let's use the templates, but fill it up with common sense. We can build a layer segmentation model, let's not overcomplicate it. We can use all the information available, owners and business. We can use proxy information or substitute information if the real information is not available and then we can build our channel and offer and strategy and everything based on the segmentation model that we have. Uh, we need to be careful about self-segmentation, we need to know what big data is, what online segmentation is, what CRM is and with that one of the 25 questions, I thank you for your attention and open for questions if anybody has any after this. Thank you very much. Great. Sandy, thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's been very exciting to learn a lot from you over the, the last couple months, and so we appreciate it. And Sandy is one of our um, experts that we work with regularly at the Small Business Banking Network. So at this point in time, we will take questions. So please feel free to um, put your questions into either the question or chat box um, if you have any specific questions. And if you have um, sort of a, a longer question or would like to be in contact with either um, myself or Sandy um, on one of these topics more in depth, please do feel free to post the question on our discussion forums as well um, on the, the Small Business Banking Network. So we'll take um, about eight or ten minutes for questions. So this is a, a great time to post any questions that you have, any clarifications that you would like on any of the information that Sandy has posted. And uh, maybe one question that we can start with Sandy is looking at how we could approach potential customers personally. So you talked a lot about segmentation but what if an institution uh, wants to have more of a personal relationship with customers? Um, how do you compare these two approaches and which do you recommend in terms of 
you know, either a really high quality segmentation or a very personal knowledge base approach. So maybe you can just talk to us a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> very good question. Um, the um, my approach will always be uh, to use the personal approach if it works. Um, here's the thing. Segmentation is an efficiency tool, okay? We use segmentation when we have a lot of potential customers or a lot of existing customers and we need to deal with them very efficiently. If we have personal information and a personal approach built into the system that always have more predictive power than any kind of segmentation because the segmentation of one is is really the most exact. So if we can afford, uh, we should use a personal approach. The caveat on all of this is that we need to know that as the company grows and as we start counting our customers in the tens or hundreds or millions, or tens or hundred thousands or millions, then the personal approach uh, is no longer that efficient. So at a certain point, we need to switch from the personal approach to a segment-based approach because we cannot physically handle the personal approach. So once again, the answer is uh, personal approach is best. If we can use it, let's use it. Uh, but let's keep in mind as the company grows and the, uh, the prospect base grows and the customer base grows, uh, we need to start moving over. Uh, to segmentation because we cannot physically handle the personalized approach anymore. We can do that in, in personal sales, in interaction, but not in terms of targeting because it, it, it is just too much time and money and effort. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and and we, we had a response. We got a, a thank you from one of our attendees. So thanks so much for this great webinar. And a, a question with that, um, in terms of segmentation, is it right to segment the clients based on a single criterion, like annual revenue, profit, sales, staff, or is it better to do a multi-layered segmentation? The, uh, <clears throat> uh, the answer is basically, it's, it's, it's almost kind of like it depends. Uh, for segmentation, the more variables we use, the better. Because um, if I use just one single variable, let's think about a personal example. If I can say male or female, that is using one uh, segmentation parameter. If I then add age, male or female, uh, age 25 to 35 or 35 to, uh, to 50 or 50 plus, then it adds richness. And then if I use occupation and education and family status, it all adds richness. So the more variables I can put into my segmentation model, the more refined it becomes. But the point is, if I do not have these more variables, then I start out with whatever I have. Uh, segmentation is a science but it needs to be treated with, uh, with an everyday practical approach in mind. I use whatever I got, I use proxies, substitute information for whatever I can use them for and whatever I don't have, I don't have and I will gradually build my model as I go into it. Uh, number one thing is let us start segmentation, let us not say that oh, I don't have that information, therefore I should not be doing any segmentation. Just start with whatever we got and then add on to it whatever else comes on stream and add on to it whatever else I can lay my hands on in terms of substitute information. That would certainly be my approach. That is what I have been using over the past 35 years and that is what I have seen to work. Great. Very, very helpful. Um, and um, we have another question about sort of the basics of things. So maybe you could talk about, um, you know, if you're going into a new market, uh, an institution really doesn't know anything about the potential segments, how would you start? You know, what would you say are the best 
first five to ten steps uh, on getting the, this, this um, segmented banking approach um, off on the right step. Hmm. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> um, number one is really uh, to gather information. Uh, I, would, uh, I would always look at what is the uh, information I can gain from the organization, say through my sales force, what is the information that is available about the market that I can uh, either bring in or buy or something. Uh, then I would take all this information, uh, check it against my business objectives, uh, see how I can start building a segmentation model, importantly start testing it, uh, start doing things based on the segmentation approach that I built, however simple it is, and see if it is more efficient than just doing things in random. Okay, um, and 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 then I would take the the further steps from there, uh, using basically using all the sources, using the whole organization, um, and 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 very importantly, within the organization. Uh, I, I would always want to make sure that everybody recognizes that SME focus means I'm treating SME as a separate segment for the organization. Uh, maybe I, I should have started there. So within the organization, I need to make sure everybody understands, guys, we're going to focus on SME or micro or whatever. That is a separate segment. Then, okay, so now I set it up. Uh, as a separate segment, I got people working on it, and then these people will go out there and find out what information I have within the organization already. Because in most organizations, once again, the sales force has information, they just keep it to themselves maybe. I, I should bring the information in, there's information about the market, I should bring it in, I should start combining this, I should start building models, and then test these models and, uh, and see if I am being more efficient. And then everything else builds on it. So it's it's kind of like a, a graduate, a gradual building job, uh, starting with okay, defining that within the organization we focus on this area, and then go out there and start gathering the information and start building the model. Uh, now that, that's basically it. once again, please do not be afraid if you do not have the information. Chances are you actually do have the information, you just have to ask, you have to go around and you have to pull it all in and if I only have one or two pieces of information, I will start with that. I will never wait until I, uh, I have 15 different data points. If I only have one or two, I will start with that and I will start building my model and then I will refine it. Again, it's uh, you can call it scientific approach, I call it the practical approach. This is, <laughs> this is kind of what works in practice. Great, Sandy. Um, we're actually going to take a question directly from one of our participants uh, from an institution in Kyrgyzstan. So, um, Rezbik, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi. Um, if you want to go ahead and ask your, your follow-up question directly to Sandy. Okay, thanks. Um, actually, Sandy has answered partially to my question. He was saying about practical approach regarding the number of billing levels in segmentation. And my question is, I want to change it a little bit. I guess I know what I have, what I have written there, but I would like to change it a little bit. Um, personally, I'm not dealing with the segmentation issue here in the bank, um, but uh, the way our per personnel is segmenting our clients into third groups like retail, SME, and corporate. It makes me crazy sometimes. So I would like to learn your ideas on this issue. What would your recommendations be regarding segmenting in a broad sense, you know, like retail, SME, and corporate? And what would be the subgroups, you know? of the retail and corporate, etc. Okay, so if, 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 if I gather it correctly, uh, uh, the, the question really deals with handling the whole segmentation process within the organization, right? 
the, the, the roadblocks that one can run into? Um, yeah, yeah, partially. But, uh, you know, every bank deals with three major groups of clients, like corporate and retail. But um, sometimes the um, definitions are not clear. And I would like to learn about your recommendations on the segmentation of those major groups. <laughs> yeah, okay. I let me tell you first of all, I can uh, I can really sympathize with you because I remember at one point when we uh, uh, had some SME segmentation definitions, and this was back in my days at Raiffeisen, and we said. Uh, uh, to Serbia that, okay, this is the model that you should be using. The guys looked at me and they said, do you realize that by, by these definitions, uh, you know, 95% of our corporate business would become part of SME? You should know that this is a different market. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I was asking. Exactly, yeah, yeah you know, and, and you have a huge big pushback. Now, there are a couple of things that, that or, or a few things that one uh, needs to do. Um, first of all, uh, one needs to be very, very pragmatic about this. If I have a corporate business that is working well uh, along certain definitions, it will always be very difficult to convince them that they should lose part of their business. So I look at it from the business perspective and I say, okay, good, if it works well like that, then for now I'm going to leave it. I'm going to start, the SME definition may be lower, at a lower level than, uh, than I, I would have normally started, okay? And then gradually build it up and, 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 and build the case for this being the right segmentation approach and build the case for the corporate guys, educating them that, you know what, it is better for you to lose the low end of your portfolio and hand it over to the SME segment than to carry on worrying about that portfolio because that is not very efficient for you. Now, I will give you a very Machiavellian advice here, <laughs> and, I, and I hope nobody is taking this conversation, but the very Machiavellian advice is to really to cater to their uh, self-esteem. They, they look at themselves, we are the corporate bankers, we know all of this stuff, and I would say, yes, you know that, but wouldn't it be nice to, to lose the low end of the corporate so that you can focus on the higher end, more value added, and your guys can really, uh, you know, justify their salaries by going after the, the bigger fish. And I will take off your hands the, uh, the, 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 the smaller units at the bottom end, and I will handle them the way that I can make money on, therefore the whole company can, can make money on. So I would appeal to their self-esteem, uh, their own self-perception. I would make the point that I am actually helping them by taking some of the, uh, the, the fragmented uh, small pieces of businesses off their hands so that they can focus on the, on the higher end. Uh, I would also not push it immediately. I, would, I normally try to avoid fights when I can and instead look for a win-win situation. So if I pitch them the win-win, as I just said, and I start building the SME segment and start showing to them and to the company that it, that it works, even if I have to start at a lower end definition where, uh, than where I would like to be, I would start there. And then, then I, would, I would gradually raise my, uh, my definition as I go along. So that, that's kind of how I would approach it to, uh, to really make it work. Again, it's, it's just practical advice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Great. No well, <laughs> thanks so much, Rizvik. <laughs> We're hoping to, okay. to do more of that in the upcoming webinars. So, um, but uh, we, we've run a, a bit over with questions, and so if you do have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or Sandy directly, or you can also post your questions on our discussion forums online. So, again, thank, ever thank you to everyone so much for joining us. We had a very diverse group today. 
And thank you so much to Sandy for um, this excellent webinar series. So thank you very much. My pleasure. And any questions, just let us know, guys, and just post it, and uh, I'll check it, and I try to answer. Send me an email. I love to do this stuff. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone.